Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Thank you everyone for thank you everyone for being here. You're very brave given <laughs> given what I'm going to share with you tonight, but I promise we'll go to a very dark and scary place and then we'll come out into a place of hope and forward thinking. Uh, yes, um, but I do admire your courage. And before I begin, I just want to find find the words to express how grateful I am to Hillsdale College, um, not only for inviting me, but for being what it is, which is truly a light right now to not just America, but to probably the world in helping us remember what liberal arts are supposed to do and what Western civilization is supposed to be for and what it means to actually take on that incredibly um, powerful and responsible and sacred task of overseeing the education of young adults from the ages of 17 or 18 to 21 or 22. And out of all the institutions that I've witnessed in the last three years, this is the only one, this is the only one in which the students have not been traumatized. I'm so grateful to all of you. So I'm just gonna jump right in. Is there, I'm a pacer. Is there a, a handheld mic I might uh, use while I pace? And, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Bell. Um, I, I'll stand here till a handheld manifests. So I, I should also start out by disclosing that I did spend my entire career um, on the left. Uh, I was an advisor to uh, Gore 2000 and to the Clinton re-election. I'm sorry, I just feel I should share. I should share this. I should get it out. I should, I should just be transparent. Um, and the last three years have shown me that my former world has truly imploded and that now, <laughs> sad but true, but the happy part is that now I think something's happening in this country in which left and right really are losing any meaning. And what really matters is what I've found, which is my brothers and sisters are right here in this room. My brothers and sisters are anyone who cares about the constitution, liberty and freedom. So I'm so happy to be with you tonight. Um, and I should also disclose in case you're worried, this is not a pharma hit. This, I ran after a puppy, or we have an adorable new puppy and he was faster than I am, so um, that's that. All right, so I'm gonna talk to you about what's really in the Pfizer documents. Um, and uh, if I pace around like this, can you hear me? Okay, um, and the reason I know what's in the Pfizer documents is not because I'm a medical doctor, I'm not. It's not because I'm a scientist, I'm not. I'm an English major. My DPhil is in Victorian poetry, but, but I know what's in the Pfizer documents because something kind of miraculous in the history of intellectual inquiry happened to me and to the world um, a, a, as a result, and it, it's the following. Uh, <clears throat> some of you may know that a lawyer named Aaron Siri uh, pursued a lawsuit against the FDA to release um, the internal documents that Pfizer uh, created as part of its uh, rollout of its mRNA injection. And these are internal documents showing um, what happened when people were injected with this material and also the experiments that led up to it internally. And thank God for the judge um, in that lawsuit because the FDA asked that judge to keep these documents hidden for 75 years, right? Until long after we are all gone. Exactly. And the judge said no. And so the documents were released. So I read this, thank you so much. And as a journalist, I was concerned because I knew that journalists, then thank you so, so much.
are not equipped to, um, as lay people, to understand the technical language in the documents. And I also knew that uh, Pfizer was releasing 55,000 documents a month. And even that is a bit deceptive because these are documents that each of them can be 10,000 pages long, right? So massive, a massive tranche of, of data and that ordinary journalists, it was gonna go into the memory hole unless we found specialized um, readers to, to read through, analyze and interpret and boil down into manageable reports. Thank you so much. What was in the Pfizer documents? So I went on War Room, which is another great irony of this moment. Oh, is it? Well, thank you so much. All right, thank you to this lovely lady who helped me be audible. Thank you. Thank you. I feel free here at Hillsdale. I can go anywhere. I can say anything. Um, <laughs> I went on War Room, which is, you know, one of these great ironies of this moment that Steve Bannon and I have this, you know, interlocutory um, platform where he listens to what I have to say, which is a miracle because I got this platform a year and a half ago um, for doing what I've done for 35 years, which is reporting on women's reproductive and sexual health. Um, in June of 2021, I reported on the fact that women were experiencing menstrual symptoms subsequent to receiving an mRNA injection. I'm a feminist. I've been a feminist forever. My first book was published when I was 26. And it is not unusual for me to call attention to symptoms that women are having that are red flags anyone who knows eighth grade biology can tell if women are having menstrual symptoms, there are going to be other bad things happening down the road. Um, and sure enough, Twitter deplatformed me for this obvious observation. And I, I was also smeared um, globally. And it turns out another lawsuit subsequently found that it was the White House, the CDC, possibly DHS, and Twitter all unlawfully colluding to deplatform and smear me for making this observation about women's health. Yeah, but fast forward, um, I was talking on War Room about the release of these documents and I called for experts to help us read through them and miraculously 2,500 experts responded to this call, and, right? Yes, yes, but the story is not over <laughs> because I was ill-equipped to manage them. And so we had physicians, we had RNs, we had biostatisticians, medical fraud invest investigators, um, lab clinicians, research scientists, uh, cardiologists, pathologists, anesthesiologists, some of the most distinguished scientists and medical people imaginable. Um, but it's virtually impossible to manage 2,500 experts around the world, uh, especially you know if you don't have this background, wading through 55,000 documents a month. So again, the reason I tell this story is I really feel like something metaphysically beautiful is happening, even in the middle of something metaphysically hideous. And that is this tiny woman, Amy Kelly, this tiny doll-like woman, and I stress her, tiny doll-like appearance because it's so stereotypical, but she's such a force of nature, right? Belying those stereotypes. She offered to be our project manager. She stepped right in and she just calmed the storm. And she organized these 2,500 experts, immediately 3,500 experts around the world into six working groups uh, with a committee at the head of each um, who were busy churning out uh, reports based on these primary source documents so that they could tell the world using the highest level of analysis possible, but broken down into language that everyone could understand what was in the Pfizer documents. So this is just stunning to me that this happened. So now there are 58 reports and now is the sad part of what I have to tell you. The Pfizer documents contain evidence of the greatest crime against humanity in the history of our species. And I, I'm so sorry to have to walk you through this, but there's no way around it. We just have to go through. And the beauty of Hillsdale is that you all are tough and like truth. 
um, and so with truth we can we can prevail. Uh, but it, it's it's painful. Um, some of the things that came to light, just some headlines. Pfizer knew, for instance, one month after rollout, so that's November of 2020, that the vaccines didn't work to stop COVID. Indeed, in the Pfizer documents, a month after rollout, and this is marketing, post marketing. So it's it's out there. The spokes models are telling you to do it. The ads are on social media. You know, the ads are on television. A month after rollout, Pfizer's internal documents identify that the vaccines have vaccine failure and um, failure of efficacy, and they identify that the third most common side effect of the Pfizer vaccine is COVID. The second headline, which is stunning, is that within a month or two, Pfizer was getting so many reports of adverse events, meaning bad things happening to people who had been injected, that they understood that they needed to hire 2,400 full-time staffers in order simply to process the paperwork of the adverse events that they were receiving reports of, as well as to prepare for the flood of adverse events that they knew they would get in the near future. Pfizer knew in May of 2021 that the vaccines had caused heart damage in 35 minors within a week after the injection. And yet, and Pfizer knew, right? You've got to understand that all of these documents say FDA confidential at the bottom of them, right? Pfizer and the FDA shared these documents. And the FDA knew that 35 minors sustained heart damage. But the government of the United States, and I'm embarrassed to say I voted for these people, didn't tell parents until August of 2021 that there was an elevated risk of heart damage in healthy young adults. Four months later, and in those four months, what did the young adults of America receive? A constant battery with propaganda on social media, on television, in news outlets, bought up by money in the CARES Act, as well as from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with like influencers showing off their injection site, saying, you know, we can do this together, we can be strong, do it for grandma, all of this aimed at young adults. They did not tell the young adults, the healthy young adults of the United States, your generation, that this was elevating a risk of heart damage till four months later. You may recall that the CDC said that the materials of the injection stay in the injection site. And the materials are lipid nanoparticles. They are mRNA. And the lipid nanoparticles are an industrial fat, which is covered in polyethylene glycol, which is a petroleum byproduct, right? And spike protein. Well, the CDC said it stays in the injection site. And then it says, and I remember asking doctors, like, relatives who are doctors and were funded by NIH grants, where does the spike protein go? And they were like, you know, when you're a journalist, you've got an ear for nonsense. They were like, well, your body metabolizes it, <laughs> you know, or well, you'll digest it and excrete it. And it's like they had no evidence to give me, to show me the basis for their response. But in fact, that's not what happens to these materials. And Pfizer knew that these materials biodistribute, this is Pfizer's language, throughout your body in 48 hours. And where do they settle? They, well, lipid nanoparticles are designed to cross every membrane in the human body. They've known this for 10 years. So where do these, these ingredients go? They go to the brain. Some of you have noticed changes in the personalities of loved ones who have taken these injections. They biodistribute to the liver, the adrenals, the spleen, and if you're a woman, they accumulate in your ovaries. Now, these are industrial fats coated with polyethylene glycol in your ovaries, okay? 
And what's really scary, Dr. Robert Chandler, who's a respected pathologist who's treated the Lakers and the Angels, he wrote this report and he shows that the chart shows the graph going down as it leaves the ejection site, but going up as it accumulates in these various organs over time. And what's incredibly scary if you're a woman is that there's no mechanism that we've found by which the body gets rid of the lipid nanoparticles in the ovaries. So your first injection, some go into your ovaries. Your second injection, more go into your ovaries. Your booster, more go into your ovaries. There's no mechanism with which the body can release this material that we've seen. Wow. I really like that woman. Naomi Wolf.